My name is Peter Weibel. I'm the CEO of the Center for the Media at Karlsruhe. And tonight I have the great pleasure and the great privilege to present you three outstanding personalities. First of all, Mr. Stephen Lavine. He graduated as doctorate from Harvard University. Then he became Associate Director for Arts and Humanities at the Rockefeller Foundation. Then he became for 29 years the president of one of the most prestigious and famous art schools in the world, California Institute of the Arts. Our second outstanding personality is Mr. Jörn Jakob Rova. He wrote many books, one for example about the famous model Verushka, Vera Gräfin von Lendorf. He created a new genre of literature, a kind of journalistic interviews with world famous personalities like Arthur Miller, David Hockney, Susan Sontag, Oscar Prize winners like uh, uh, Thierry Sanders from Geschlöndorf, his Nobel Prize winners like Doris Lessing in the Kertisch. So he has book, Seismography of Questions, Seismography of Fragen, and also in the other book, Beyond the Fame, Beyond the Room, he created this a new genre in literature. And he made a book, and this is the reason why we came together, he made a book about Stephen Lavine, Failure is what it's all about, a life devoted to leadership in the arts. This is the reason why we meet together tonight. And I'm very grateful to our third person, personality, Annette J. Lehmann. She's professor of contemporary art, visual Health, culture and theater at the Free University of Berlin. She's also an expert, great expert, because she wrote a book together with Verena Kittel, also from the Free University of Berlin. The book is called Tacit Knowledge, Post-Studio Feminism at Kale Arts between 1970 and 77. And she wrote many other books, uh, and she made even a conference about the subject. And one of the books is Black like Mountain Research and Exposure, Visual Culture in the 19th Century America and Art and New Media. So now we have really three outstanding personalities and experts to discuss the question about leadership. I also welcome Anna Matia Gulandris. She will be our host. Please, Gulandris, start your function as a host. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Weibel. Um, hello and a warm welcome to all of you who are watching. My hello. name is Adamandia Gulandris and I will pass on any questions you might have um, at the end of this online talk to the speakers. So feel free to post any questions you might have directly into our YouTube chat um, of this live stream. I hope you enjoy today's online conversation, which is moderated by Annette Jaelemann Kölisch. And I'm very much looking forward to it. So I pass on to you now, Annette. Thank you so much. Wait, wait, uh, wait a moment, Professor Lehmann. I, I want to give you a hint how attentive and meticulous Mr. Lavine is because in the background of his office, you see flat two books of mine. This is very, very <laughs> sweet and attentive gesture, huh? uh, Dr. Lavine. Yeah? Okay. And I thank you so much, Professor Lehmann, that you uh, joined us and to direct uh, this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, you know introducing us and also hosting this event. And good evening and a warm welcome to everyone, everybody at home watching this event. And I would like to start this event by briefly highlighting some important cornerstones of your extensive biography, Stephen and Jörn. So um, as Peter mentioned, for 29 years, Stephen D. Levine served as president of the California Institute of the Arts, stepping down in the year 2017. During his time at CalArts, he increased the number of programs and enrollments, grew the Institute's reputation and financial stability, and above all, maintained CalArts spirit of creative and interdisciplinary exploration. Shortly thereafter, he became founding director of the Thomas Mann House in Los Angeles and established a residency in public presentation series to address pressing contemporary issues, particularly the future of democracy. He currently chairs the advisory board of the Thomas Mann House. Before arriving at CalArts, Stephen Levine worked as an assistant professor of English and American literature at the University of Michigan between 1974 and 1981, and as an assistant and then associate director of arts and humanities at the Rockefeller Foundation 
between 1981 and 1988. Two books he co-edited, both of which come out of his work at the Rockefeller Foundation, have become uh, foundational for the discussion of diversity in museum practices. First, exhibition cultures, the poetics and politics of museum display. And secondly, museums and communities, the politics of public culture. He has been an active contributor to the Los Angeles and national cultural and educational communities for many years, serving at various times on the board of American Council of Education, the American Council of the Arts, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the operating company of the Los Angeles Music Center, KCRWFM Public Radio, KCET Public Television, the Idlewild Arts Academy, the Villa Aurora Foundation for European American Relations, and the visiting committee of the J. Paul Getty Museum. In, the, in addition to the Thomas Mann House, he currently serves on the board of the Guggenheim Foundation, the American University in Rome, the Kotzen Foundation of Art of Teaching, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. He has been honored with a cross of order of merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, we call it Bundesverdienstkreuz, and Mexico's Botelli Award. Um, Jörn Jakob Röver is an award-winning writer known for merging elements of literature and journalism in his essays. He has published in news magazines such as Neue Züricher Zeitung, Tagesanzeiger und Frankfurter Rundschau, lectured in Germany, Switzerland, and the US, and taught at the University der Künste UDK here in Berlin. He also has received numerous international fellowships and foundation grants, including, for example, you from Duke University and Villa Aurora. His lengthy profile conversations with luminaries from the arts, sciences, and society have been collected in a book of nearly 900 pages published by Salas in the year 2014 and is currently in English translation. Jörn is the author of seven books, including Reflections on a Soul, on the photographic artworks of Dale Grant and Viroschka Mein Leben, conversation-based biography of German artist Vera Countess Lienhoff. He lives and works in Berlin. Very warm welcome to you. It was great that we could speak and see uh, and connect a bit yesterday. Um, allow me now a very brief and personal account of my experience reading this marvelous biography. I put it up here. Um, what struck me first was the, its title, Stephen D. Levine, Failure is What It's All About, A Life Devoted to Leadership in the Arts, uh, alongside its cover photo. If you see the cover photo, it's really striking. Then if you open the book and examine the envelope, its subtitle, which reads simply, trying to hit the ball despite seeing double. Shortly after this, the reader encounters an excerpt from one of the conversations between Stephen D. Levine and Jörn Jakob Rova, where Stephen concludes, but I didn't know what else to do. I have to confess that I hardly ever read or read biographies, maybe because I am, I, maybe because I perceive them as a very conventional genre, or maybe I'm still under the influence of reading an essay by Pierre Bourdieu a very long time ago called the biographical illusion. However, all my superficial skepticism in regards to biographies have evaporated after reading Failure, What This All About. Why? Because this first biography that I have read based entirely on an in-depth dialogue, a complex questionnaire that carries out a performative magic. So let me just pick out one passage of many from your dialogue, Stephen and Jörn. This is from a chapter titled Shaping the Future, in which Jörn stated, you have been able to live up the American dream. And at the end of Stephen's elegant reply, he states, quote, education in large measure is about being exposed to examples. That's what I believe in. I'm very honored today to have been invited to moderate a live conversation between Stephen D. D. Levine and Jörn Jörg Rover. I'd like to start by asking Stephen, 
what makes the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia or CalArts such a uh, special place for creativity? I would love to answer that question. First, let me just say how pleased I am uh, to be here hosted by ZKM. Um, there are only a couple of institutions in the world that CalArts looks at as, um, not as peers, but as people to learn from uh, and to try to keep pace with. And ZKM is central among those organizations. So it's a, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, CalArts, uh, Walt, Walt Disney was the founder of CalArts. Um, well, not in my view, an artist. Uh, he had the perfectionism of an artist. Every film he ever made lost money uh, for the first decade because he insisted on doing the work until he got it, in his view, right. And there's a reason that those are almost the only films that can still be released as if they were contemporary films, those early animated uh, Disney films. The last 10 years of his life, uh, he devoted to two projects. Uh, one was Epcot Center in Florida, which was intended uh, to be a planned city, not to be a, a corporate advertising locale, which is what it turned out to be. Um, he could never actually work out the politics of a planned city. He wanted uniformity and he was explained by his, uh, his advisors that what he was describing was fascism uh, as a system of local governance. And that, that and he, obviously that wasn't a choice. The other was CalArts. And he said toward the end of his life that this is the thing he hoped he would be remembered for in the long run. Uh, Walt died, he, he legally came to exist in 61. Um, he died in 66. It didn't really open. The first presidents and deans were hired in, 60, in 67 after he died. Uh, one of, in one of the great ironies of history, uh, or of, of art history, um, the chairman of the board at that point was Robert Haldeman of Watergate fame, uh, who was actually a, a PR person primarily. And he had just gotten the mandate to hire the best people he could hire. Uh, to run the various schools at CalArts, uh, even though he knew nothing about the arts. As a result, he hired an amazing set of artists, all of whom would be in sort of 180 degrees separate from uh, or opposite Walt Disney uh, in their politics. And Herb, uh, Herb Lau, uh, who was the first, he founded the theaters at Lincoln Center and was the first both provost and I'll make this short. I realize I'm going on this. This rate will spend the whole hour. Um, I just love this story. Uh, had just founded the theaters at Lincoln Center, uh, was fired shortly thereafter because of the whole thing that was so anti the US government. Um, when uh, Haldeman interviewed him, uh, uh, Blau said to him, um, You don't want to hire me. I'm a Marxist. <laughs> And said, but they tell me you're the best theater person in America. And Blau, who was not a modest man, said, I am the best theater person in America. Uh, he, and Haldeman said, then I want to hire you. Well, what an amazing beginning for a school. Uh, and if you go, if you go through the, the founders, uh, Robert Corgan had just founded what's now the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. Um, uh, Paul Brock was a second generation abstract expressionist. He immediately hired Alan Capro, who was doing work entirely different than his own. Um, uh, Sandy Kendrick, who was who had, after years making films at the Ealing Studios in England, had come and made the toughest film ever about Hollywood, called Sweet Smell of Success, was offered the chance to either start CalArts or start the British Film Institute. And he chose to start the film school at CalArts. Well, you get the picture. And then they gathered around them a whole set of Fluxus artists. Uh, Emmett mm -hmm. Williams, Nam June Paik, Allison Knoll, uh, uh, shortly thereafter, James Tenney. Uh, we already mentioned Alan Capro. So they started with just an amazing assemblage of artists and uh, a conviction that what was being offered in the past as the educational artist just was long headed. Um, interestingly, this goes back to Walt Disney as well, who felt that the artists he had to, he had to work with on animated films in a, uh, and Disneyland were just too narrowly educated. Mm -hmm. uh, you knew how to draw, you didn't know music. Because most animation was to music, um, they had to, he basically had to send them all back to school uh, to learn the things they hadn't learned in college. 
So they set out to be completely interdisciplinary, uh, completely focused on uh, the future. The question always was what, what's next? What matters now? What can make a difference now? Um, a, a strong uh, political base uh, coming partially out of these fluxus artists, partially out of just starting in the 1970s, where if you were a major artist, it's pretty hard not to be engaged uh, politically and, and socially. Uh, we, we, we just heard uh, online yesterday uh, from an early graduate who said it was like paradise to be at CalArts then. Uh, all these offerings, you got to choose any of them, you got to put, there was no curriculum, you put together the education you wanted. Uh, and uh, I think that was the experience of that first generation, the generation that you had to have, have uh, written about. Uh, the challenge for CalArts was uh, that generation had, had uh, the school basically was close to bankruptcy, had to be restructured. And the challenge always has been, how do you maintain that total freedom? Uh, a freedom that in many ways relates to Black Mountain College, which is our direct predecessor, although we also look to the bar. Um, how do you maintain that freedom with enough uh, order and system and economic base uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't the government support uh, to its arts organization? Um, and I, to me, the remarkable achievement of CalArts is over the years, it's, it's never been as utopian as the beginning. Mm -hmm. It has kept that fundamental commitment uh, to interdisciplinarity, to creative freedom, to, uh, to pushing yourself to do something that matters. Uh, maybe, maybe I should stop there for now, and we can fill in some of the other pieces later. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. That was really an interesting um introduction also that you mentioned uh, Walt Disney. Um, for everybody who is interested, there's really a very um, interesting film he made about Cal Arts in the early years. And you can really see, you know, the difference of the spirit of that time. You know, it was kind of a commercial film he did on Cal Arts. And, and you, you get a pretty strong impression from that film how revolutionary um, the ideas and, and the artists who were actually at Carl's operated, you know. And um, also maybe to add for the audience who, who are not familiar with Cal Arts, the interesting thing is also like with the Bauhaus or Black Mountain, that it's, it's a bit outside of a large city, you know. It's like, you know, you drive out there for an hour, it's kind of an idyllic landscape and it's kind of in a in a secluded place and it's really interesting also in comparison to New York and other hot spots for creativity and you know product artistic production that, that that was such a fruitful place for establishing new forms of you know creative uh, work but today uh, um, we want to talk about this beautiful book you know and um, and this beautiful biography and this uh, in-depth dialogue you um, uh, unfolded I think over a length of time with Jaron, and now I want to ask you, Jaron, um, uh, you are very known for your in-depth profiles of cultural figures and, and, and also leaders in the cultural field um, internationally. Uh, why and how um, do you, did you decide to write the book, Stephen D. Levine, Failure, uh, What's All About? And maybe later we can also talk about the title a bit. So, Jaren, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> I can hear you very well. Uh, first of all, I would also like to thank our host, uh, Professor Weibel and the ZKM, for having us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you uh, together here, even if it is only virtual. Um, but maybe in the future, we will have a chance uh, to come together in Karlsruhe, where you actually are. Stephen in Los is in Los Angeles. Annette and I are in Berlin. So very welcome to everybody from Berlin. Um, the origins of um, uh, writing biographies actually lie in my family history because I, I, I would say that my family has been sort of uh, obsessed by genealogy for a long, long time. So mm -hmm. the family archives at some point had been passed on to me. Um, so everything of my family history is here and ready for me to to read, to be read, to be looked at. 
but as a child, I already grew up with tons of documents, of photographs, of stories of people who had long been deceased. Um, so this family and its members, its my forefathers, always surrounded me like ghosts, like ghosts who were actually alive. Um, and that was very special. It sort of distinguished me from, from other children because I didn't know any children who had the same experience. So I think that is where um, my interest and my fascination for biographies originates. Um, I remember that as a schoolboy, when we were asked to write an essay and the topic was free to be chosen, I fabricated uh, the life of a person. <laughs> I made it up. I, I made a person alive that didn't exist and I was totally, I totally indulged in it. Um, when I decided that I would write the book um, about Stephen and with Stephen, that was already long after I had started um, work as a, a conversationalist and biographer, almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, what struck me about Stephen, um, although I had known him for a long time already, was that um, he's a very modest and innocent man, basically, and he doesn't put himself in the front row. Um, but he helped so many, he helped thousands of students to actually get into the front row and uh, gain and receive the applause. And so I was interested uh, in in the person who he is, um, well known, but after all, not known. No one knew his story and no one really asked who is, what makes a person who is willing, ready and able and determined passionately to help others live and strive in the arts and even those who are poor. And uh, I think he fought for raising funds for them, millions and millions. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish this book would also be written in Germany because I think Stephen gives a great example as an enabler for the arts, as someone who shows us what you can do if you're really passionate about um, art and the people who create the art. And that is why I chose to do it. And um, you, you know the results, Annette. Yeah, thank you. I think it's really uh, interesting keyword also when I, you know, I recommended the book now to my students and also encourage them to watch today because they are also studying to be curators and, you know, to make art happen, you know, and, and provide for certain things. And I think he, he's really a, a wonderful, I mean, outstanding role model for a, a, um, an action or an actor in that arena. I mean, absolutely outstanding. I mean, really, I must say, really, if, if we look at the history of Kell Arts and, and what he did there is really unprecedented. And But still, I mean, you also gave me a very kind of intimate um, insight in, in, the, in the genealogy of this book by um, telling me that Stephen's wife, the writer and photographer Janet Sternberg, was um, also a driving force behind this project. And uh, how, how did, do you all feel about this outcome? And how did that come about as a dynamic between the three of you? Stephen, please, first. One, one can, you can both answer that question if you like. I really didn't want to do it. <laughs> I left Cal Arts and had filled my mind all those years. Uh, I was ready to go on to something else. I didn't know what it would be. It turned out to be Thomas Monhouse. Uh, but I, I didn't want to spend my time thinking about the past. Um, my wife, Janet, who had, be, who had been my partner really and in, in my advisor and in everything I did, thought there should be a record of what was accomplished at Cal Arts during those years. Um, that, that it was, as you say, fairly un, unprecedented and that it would be useful to have that, to, to have that knowledge uh, held somewhere. Um, she was friends with Jorn 
who had written a wonderful essay about her photography and her writing uh, many years before um, and uh, brought Yorn into the project. Um, and Yorn, and this is, this is in a way what made it interest, more interesting than I thought it was going to be, uh, Yorn had a much broader take on it, uh, not the details of what we did at CalArts. I mean, there's some of that, but uh, where the values came from uh, that drove those years, both in terms of uh, my style of leadership and in terms of the kinds of programs we started at Keller. Um, when the book first came, I, I was afraid to read it. Uh, <laughs> I knew I had wandered in these conversations. I had wandered all over the place. I thought received something shapeless uh, and embarrassing. And instead, Jorn had, had sort of seen through it, it to, uh, to what the real story was, the human story uh, and the cultural story. Uh, and now I'm just, I'm just thrilled that the book exists and I'm very happy with it. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> well, I think also I really want to stress that because when I read it, it it's, not, it's not written in a linear fashion. It's really having, it's bringing up very strong topics, you know, alongside with a very intimate and personal story. And that kind of is intertwined uh, in a narrative, which is really, um, yeah, it's really absolutely intriguing to read. One more uh, remark on my reading, you know, I was really happy and surprised that I was invited. And at first I felt stressed, oh my God, I have to work on that and so on. But then I really had a wonderful reading. I, I read it like a whole weekend and was really, it had a lot of substance, but it also was like a, 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 an easy reading. You were drawn into it and everything kind of made sense in some ways, even though it was, of course, and it is written in a style where you have particular topics, with, which are, in my opinion, really universal and even politically uh, political and interesting from that regard. But let me go a little bit um, deeper in your, also what the book offers and that I can perfectly understand. I was, I was trying to add something because um, I haven't answered your question. Okay. Was, sorry, yeah. interrupt you. You, mm -hmm. uh, um, you ask uh, about the outcome and how, how we think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and as Stephen said, this it wasn't planned to be a book originally. It was okay. merely uh, uh, intended to be a record. And uh, when I came into the project, uh, I thought this is not the kind of work I'm doing. I'm not doing records. Um, I want to paint a much larger picture. And um, what means a lot to me is that Stephen, who is actually the one who is being portrayed, is content with that. So that, mm -hmm. is, that means a lot to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we've taken it to a much much different place than it was originally intended. And now we can share it with readers around the world, uh, which is a great experience. And that's why we're here today. Yeah, and I think you're, you're right, because that there's two merging kind of lines of discourses, you know, if you might say it like that. It, it's one of, of your history as a grandchild of the war in Germany and your family history and your interest in genealogy. And then there is, of course, and I was surprised that, you know, Stephen was sharing this with um, an audience. Of course, his family history, his, you know, Eastern uh, European Jewish background and his upbringing, um, the values in his family, um, what the parents, you know, did to provide for an education and so forth. And um, yeah, this is, this is really a, a an interesting insight. So how do you feel about this, Stephen, to share information or not? It's not information, it's really your life with, um, with many. Well, there, there, there are two things I find, well, three things, well, many things that I find very satisfying. Um, one was the, the chance to talk about my parents. Mm. And I felt like I had a chance to give them a second life. Um, and uh, several friends who knew the, my parents uh, picked out that element as, uh, I mean, they knew them too, and were just glad to be to have them brought back. Um, second, um, I was always interested in that that uh, generation of sort of 
1890s through about 1940, uh, of uh, Jews who were trying to enter uh, German and cosmopolitan culture more generally and were partially allowed in and partially always seen as outsiders. Um, I always cared about them. Uh, having read my own biography, and as Jorn wrote it, now I'm reading biographies of Gershom Scholem and of Theodor Adorno mm -hmm. and of, of that generation, uh, having, having discovered those things in the watered down, I mean, obviously I'm a gen several generations later. Uh, mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember that uh, it was about 10 years ago uh, when I sat in a cafe with Stephen and Janet and I asked both of them, how do you actually feel about your ancestors? How do you feel about your roots? And Janet very quickly said, um, I feel completely American. I don't really care about it. Um, and, and that is that. Where Stephen said, well, I'm not so sure. I think I do care about it. And that's sort of stuck to my mind. I thought that's interesting. One day I'm gonna ask him about it and go try to go in depth. And that's why I did it. And he was ready to talk about it. Conversation. I'm sorry? I said, just said I'd forgotten that conversation, but now mm -hmm. that you bring it up, I, I remember it well. <laughs> yeah. But I think yeah. it's only after seeing your exposition of my life and putting in those deep backgrounds that I think an American writer probably wouldn't have put in. Um, I think it comes issues of German-American uh, collaboration in an interesting way. Um, Here I go back to, to what I said before, to my family history and genealogy. I think uh, there's nothing more fascinating for me than trying to put the pieces of a person together and um, sort of uh, construct uh, a larger Im image in order to share it with others. Uh, is there anything more fascinating than the mind of a person, than the feelings of someone, than um, the character that we take for granted and we don't know where it actually comes from, how it was built, how it was made, um, the motives of a person, all of that, and it roots in our past and in our history. And I also believe in epigenetics. I believe in the, the meaning of experiences which we are not truly aware of, but which are sort of built into us. And uh, tracing back Stephen's family history with him, making him talk about it, I think also helped him to bring something more forward, more to his consciousness, which was sort of um, hidden and un unnoticed. Or... And actually, Annette, to go to your opening point, um, I think since, at least since the, the generations of, of Max Weber and then uh, Benjamin and Adorno, um, there's been this critique of biography as always utopian, uh, mm -hmm. always uh, idealizing something uh, totally, it, however hard the writer tries, you end up there. I think Jorn has invented a form that lets you have your confusions and your stops and starts and your, it, it's not an idealized version. I mean, maybe it's a little idealized, but, but it's not fundamentally an idealized version of a life. It is, uh, it's, a, it's the voice of a life. Absolutely, I totally agree. This was my impression from the book. And also, you know, it was kind of a, sometimes the questionnaire really reminded me also of a dialogue, not only between friends, you know, and, and people who are really trusting each other, but also it was a questionnaire from my opinion, which is really like had a very um, deep, you know, um, knowledge of psychology and empathy, you know, because the, the questions are so differentiated and they're, they're not intrusive, but they're very intimate, you know, like, for instance, I, I just pick out one, I mean, this is not the most imminent, but did, did your parents' moral and ethical attitudes matter to you? I mean, this is like a, usually it's a question where, you know, there could be conflict or there is, 
you know, this is the really deep moment where, you know, your upbringing is kind of in any ways forming your life, you know, and I think there is also in terms of what we talked about in the beginning, in terms of looking at your work at CalArts, of course, that's also a result of, of this kind of upbringing, you know, to be totally devoted uh, to, you know, a task and to uh, fostering uh, uh, and providing for, you know, creative developments. And also it was sweet that your parents said, um, oh, you know, the best thing you can do is being a doctor, a medical doctor, right? And in, in some ways, you know, you, and, 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 and then you said, and then that brings me to the point where, you know, we want to approach this title again of the book, Failure, that is what it's all about. You know, when I read at first the title, I thought, oh, he is really a very, you know, successful and influential and very good networking person, very well known. So why is there this word of failure? And it certainly does not only have something to do with this Beckett quote, but maybe uh, as another aspect of your experience, which might be really encouraging for the young generation, because it comes, I think, I assume that, you know, I, I can't speak for you, but maybe you answer me that next question. I think it may come from the experience that success is often achieved um, by those who know that failure is inevitable. And this is like a quote, I, I, I think Coco Chanel or somebody said that before, but it's the same. And I, I wonder, um, you know, what, what it means to, what this quote from Beckett may mean to you, you know, try again, fail again, fail better. Uh, what, what is your understanding of success and failure? Well, first of all, um, my perception of a person uh, is sort of, um, well, in other words, a person is coherent to me if he or she is able to admit um, also the, the downside of his or her appearance. Uh, that mean that includes the failure. That is one thing. And Stephen was uh, was candid enough to talk about uh, um, also a subject like depression, for instance. Um, and that is that makes him human. That is very important to me. And the other as aspect is how do you handle failure or what we might perceive as failure? Um, and um, and I think he, he is an example for managing it very, very well because mm -hmm. it means you fall and you get up again and you wonder why did I, why did I, why did I fall? And, um, you know, what, what is it that I can do the next time that, that I can improve myself and I can evolve um, and I can learn from it. And so then failure turns out to be something positive, something creative. And that is why failure is, in the end, all about. And that's why I chose the title of the book. It's also very tricky. Uh, you would, it's it, in the very first place, it's not appealing, but it makes you think, it makes you wonder, as you sort of stumble when you read that title. Mm -hmm. And that I think it's important. Mm -hmm. my, my mother said out, to, oh, Peter. Perfect. Yeah, I was, uh, but start your, your answer and then I would ask you two questions, Stephen. But first, please uh, ask, continue your answer. Okay. Um, just my, my mother uh, set out to be a concert pianist. Uh, she won competitions, but she had neither the financial background nor um, the self confidence for a career. Uh, and as a result, spent her life depressed, basically. Um, and I, I lived with that. Uh, and I lived with the fear that confronted with mm -hmm. a defeat, a real defeat, I would be defeated. Uh, and I just carried, carried that around uh, constantly. Um, in a way, being a, a college president is a it's a good way to cope with that because you're defeated again and again. Uh, you try to get things uh, to happen and the faculty just want it to happen and you try another way, you try another way. Um, mm -hmm. 
the, in a way, key moment in the in in my life. And well, the key moment is meeting my wife and marrying her. But the other key moment uh, is when the Northridge earthquake uh, shut CalArts down altogether. Um, and uh, there was a couple hour period where I was just, I didn't know what, I was just lost or paralyzed. Um, and then you just put one foot in front of the other um, and you realize the big problem is a bunch of little problems aggregated. You have to separate them and just keep addressing it. Um, and where I wanna take that is, it was really important in the education that we offer the students at Kellogg that they be urged to go beyond what they what they thought they could do. Uh, that we not in any way punish failure uh, or uh, give people, we try not to have grades, we have sort of grades, but, but try not to devalue de it. In fact, to teach the lesson uh, that unless you're, you're aiming for something big enough that you can fail, you're probably not aiming anything big enough to be worth accomplishing. Um, and that's easy to say. It is a tough thing for a young person to learn, uh, especially if they've been through a school system where your your reward, I mean, previous your rewards mm -hmm. are for not failing. Um, so it, 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 I, I love that there's a kind of direct line from my mother's experience to my not wanting the kids to tell us to have that experience. That, that experience. I think it's a I think, I think it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful that you mentioned that, especially for the young people, because most teachers, you know, they are, there are, that's a, it's a bad learning construct to avoid. If you avoid failure, you avoid success. I mean, there is really um, interesting educators, for instance, Buckminster Fuller or other people just as one figure. I mean, most of their experiments and, you know, designs or ideas in the beginning, weren't realized, you know, they collapsed or they didn't work out, you know, and I think it's more important to try uh, and, and try again and fail again. That's a good example for that, you know, and, and I, you know, I perceive or perceived CalArts or in my research and, and beyond as a place where that was possible. And I think you were the one who, you know, uh, um, really made or laid ground for that kind of specific field of experimentation uh, in general uh, and, and let it grow. Like, for instance, you were one of the first who was really uh, in the early years, like in the early 90s, uh, interested in diversity and inclusion and equal opportunity, which are now, again, you know, contested or highly debated um, concepts. And maybe you can elaborate a little bit on, on your experience uh, at, at your Rockefeller Foundation, but at, also at CalArts on that, because I think it's, it's, uh, it's a really important issue today for also for the students and many other challenges. Before I answer, let, let me turn to uh, Professor Weibel, who <laughs> had something to say earlier and seated the ground yeah, to you. me, and I don't want to lose it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, Stephen. I have two, I have two very, very questions, questions uh, to you. To you. Uh, you have, you have been, been head of very, very successful, successful art institutions, institutions for the years, years. and as Keller has generated, 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 generated most surprise winners, winners like, like with the Big Loaf, Big Loaf, always a prize winner, winners, fellows, fellows, and etc. Now, the question is this, this is this, this is this, we have generated, made it, made it. Now I have the image. We are the same, same thing. No. Okay, okay. <laughs> now I have the full picture. It's better, it's better. Okay, okay. There we are, actually, the four of us. <laughs> yeah, I, maybe we can um, continue our conversation and, and ask the question. One moment, one moment, coming. Is coming. Uh, we think it's a problem. Uh, we can continue. Uh, 
Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, my question to Stephen. Your institute, which you headed for 30 years, you have such an enormous experience. And this institute has created, generated Oscar Prize winners like Kaiser Bigelow, Pulitzer Prize winners, Fellows for Groom, etc. Now the question is, is this pure chance or can you predict this kind of success or can you even plan it? And I ask you this because today we have uh, people who are uh, managing data. No? No? So we have today what they call network thinking built on data. You have enormous amounts of data and now we have mathematical models that you can say with the help of this data we can predict your future. There's a book called Formula of Success by Mr. Barabasi. He's one of the most uh, uh, brilliant mathematicians in network theory. Yeah? And he's written a book about Formula of Success and he says and he claims when an artist starts his career, yeah, the date when he does it, in which city, in which gallery, already makes very clear if he will have success or not have success. So my question is now, as you, can you say there are hidden talents that you can know in the head swiftly become a successful teacher, a successful artist, or is it everything just chance? What is your experience after 30 years? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I, I would say there, there are a small number of, of I'm just going to talk about the students because that's my, that's my frame for seeing yeah. this. There was a small number of students who had already found their direction and you could see that they were on the way to success. Mark Bradford, who's getting a lot of chance, uh, opportunity now, uh, was already as, as a, a student uh, doing extraordinary work and we all knew it. Uh, but, th but there's a whole other tier of people who ended up having a, a success in fields they weren't even operating in at Kellogg. Um, that uh, they, they set out to be graphic designers. Uh, Jim Lapine, the Stephen Sondheim's collaborator, uh, a real genius in, in his form, set out, set out to be a, a graphic designer, then uh, became a theater director. Uh, I, I don't know his friends from that time, but my guess is it's completely unpredictable, uh, both where it will be uh, and, and what it will look at look uh, like. Um, I guess the thing I would add to it is a bad education can actually kill the process. It can actually sort of more nearly guarantee the result that one isn't a success um, uh, by trapping. People in, in directions that are not sustainable for them. Uh, one, of, one of my uh, really happy moments at Calix was going to a, a final session that the graphic design faculty uh, uh, had with the students. And what they were telling them was, is what they thought ought to be doing next, what ought to be working on. Mm -hmm. The things they couldn't do they, that, they, that they shouldn't give up on. Um, and they were pointing for the fact that it's a life in the arts is a, it's a life. You know, it's, it's, you have to think. I get a lot of people asking me, do I think you know, the virus is going to change the arts that people have to do? And my general answer is not the one to want to hear, but it is interesting. My general answer is the artists develop on their own art. Uh, to their, in the direction. And if that's the key with the, the pandemic, uh, maybe there'll be a big mix uh, in the immediate wake of the pandemic, but finally, the art in the direction uh, will reassert itself. Uh, and it's not sure whether the pandemic will ever be absorbed into what they, what they care about or not. So I'm, my answer to you is I, I'd be very surprised if we could ever uh, uh, predict this with success. Although again, I think you can predict failure with greater, with more, more frequency. <laughs> but I, I might add from, from, my, from my experience. So, what, what, so, so you think, Stephen, there's no formula of success. There's no formula of success. Right. There's no formula, no? okay. Except, uh, except 
some there's some element of passion and determination. Okay. And, and, and obsession. And if you lack those things, then there is no arc that carries you into a future. Okay. Uh, we stop, but that would that would be the only thing I can pick out as the common element. Right. I remember. That, uh, I remember that. Um, um, uh, who's who, who was the inventor of the famous museums in Cologne? Peter Ludwig. Peter Ludwig. Peter Ludwig. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I remember he yeah. told he, he telling me in our conversation without greed and obsession. There is no success at all in whatever you do. Um, that sort of stuck to my mind. But I think um, there's also another element that is important for success, that is will. You need will, you need patience, you need uh, devotion, and you also need to be humble enough to do many things uh, by practicing your art that are not convenient. Uh, for instance, if you write, uh, it, working on a manuscript is, is something that includes lots and loads and loads of redundant um, editing, which is very boring. But it, that's what it takes in order to sort of polish it. But I remember that as a child, I always felt that I was um, a spectator already. I was not a partaker. So uh, I guess it was in a way society that distinguished me or that separated me from the others. Um, that was very hard and sometimes painful. But uh, as you grow older, you learn to fight for that and you learn to create your place. And I think that's what artists do. Um, and then success in the end is a very relative thing. Who, who is you know, the one to, to, to judge actually what it is that makes you successful. It's, I think it's very subjective. Um, is it the market? Is it the, the happiness that you feel by what you do? Is it the appreciation of others? Is it all of that? Um, but, uh, but what is interesting is that today is the age of the number crunching and enormous amount of data processing uh, said some people wrote the book said I have investigated hundreds of thousands of artistic careers uh, that for the first time we have been possible we have been able to process millions of that data of thousands hundreds of thousands of artists career in the market precisely uh, and he said in the book in the, after the first year when you, when you see in which gallery in which time in which town at what time he makes an exhibition, you can predict uh, if he may make a career or not. Uh, this is a little bit against the mythology of 19th century uh, about the uh, free life of the artist. But now I have my second question, my last question to Stephen. When you came to Kailats, people told, tell, told me it was more or less a kind of freewheeling madehouse. Uh, uh, and now, no, no, now we turned it into such a successful institution. Can you agree with Einstein? Einstein said it needs chaos to create a world, but it needs order to maintain a world. It's a wonder. I don't know that expression. It's 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 perfectly that. Uh, when I when I got to when I arrived at CalArts, it it already had a number of principles of order, uh, but. Um, its specialty was chaos, <laughs> and the, and the faculty were terrified that I was gonna, I was gonna disrupt the chaos, um, and um, I have to say, in everything we did, um, had to be really careful not to do that. It had to leave this large space um, where anything was possible, uh, and often that space was outside of the class, not in what you were studying, but. Uh, in other contexts altogether. I, I think in uh, something Annetta did, we, she talked about at Black Mountain College, the dining room was the, was the most important place because it's where, they, where all the artists met and yeah. um, things, things happened that were unpredictable. Um, so we, 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 how to say this, we, we established uh, I, I hope we established order where it needed to be, which was more in the administration 
uh, than anywhere else um, and maintain the, the sort of freewheeling atmosphere where it needed to be. Um, but it was a kind of problem that we had some chaos in the administration as well, which there was, there was no good creative reason to justify that. <laughs> It was nearly it was it was nearly bankrupt when you came before you came, no? Yeah, it had been. Uh, I remember when I showed when I was at the Rockefeller Foundation, I showed the finances to the, the treasurer, and he said, "I wouldn't go near this institution. That it's um, this is structural. They are shipped for voyage." Was his way of putting it, um, and. I had a kind of naive faith that something that had accomplished as much as Cal Arts just it just couldn't be true that this would this, that this would die um, that there, there couldn't be a way to go on. People would say, well, "What about Black Mountain College? They didn't go on." Exactly, uh, exactly. And, and, yeah, it's uh, true. But yeah, because of financing and you know people ran away and so on and the structures. But now I think it would be also interesting to you know come back to your career now because you are have become recently um, the founding director and chair of the um, American Advisory Council for the Thomas Mann House in Los Angeles, and I think that's also bringing um, certain uh, strains of your biography, this European context, you know the. Uh, the, the cultural history of the U United States and Europe, ex especially the exile culture, um, uh, together. And I wonder uh, how you became involved with the Thomas Mann House. And now I also see that there is a necessary shift, or there is a shift in terms of your activities there towards, you know, politics and also um, the question, for instance, uh, Goloman. Um, Uh, uh, raised and others, you know, what is the future of democracy and what is the future of democracy and the arts, um, you know, um, uh, uh, in terms of the current pandemic, these are two big questions, you know, and also it's, it, it's really interesting that the Thomas Mann House and the Villa Aurora are really um, culturally and historically also spaces where the arts merged, but under really dire circumstances, you know, it was a very difficult start. And I see a pattern there, you always intervene or you always kind of get into environments where there is a certain existential uh, challenge or, you know, threat, uh, and then you are there and trying to take care of it and handle it in some ways and make it work uh, personally as for people, but also as an institution. So um, I would be very interested to hear about, you know, your future plans or your directions or your strategy, one might even say, for Thomas Mannhaus and, and of course also the connection and the bridge between the United States and Germany, because it's a common shared project. And then finally, maybe some comments on the pandemic also for the students, because they're very existentially concerned, you know, what, what is the outcome of it? What is their future? And then I would like to open up the questions for everyone. <laughs> okay, it's a, a big series of questions. Um, I, I once read a, a biography of uh, President Truman. Uh, its main point was you don't have to be very smart to be president. Um, no matter how smart you are, you're going to be dealing every day in things you know nothing about that you have to know what you believe uh, and have that as the reference point that keeps you going. And what, partially what I realized in my conversations with Jorn is that I was in, in some ways less driven by art than by what I believed, which was uh, equal opportunity, that for democracy to work, you had to have powerful voices representing every piece of the society. Um, that was probably a little bit of a naive view in itself. It turns out to be a lot more complicated, I'm learning. Uh, but that certainly that's, that's a minimum. Um, and I think it, and, and that for at least the United States, diver I think now for pretty much everybody, uh, diversity is just, it's, it's a fact of life. Uh, and one has to take advantage of that fact of life and not try to, not try to fend it off, uh, but try to make that part of the richness of what is. Um, I think those principles kept me going uh, as I dealt with 
um, I mean, I was asked to figure out what to do about various electronic things that I didn't know the first thing about. Um, and part of it was just trusting good people. Uh, but part of it is, was just keeping my eye on the, that set of things. So the transition to, to the Thomas Mann House, uh, the way it happened was I got involved with the Villa Aurora when it first started. I thought if the German government was gonna put this money to bring German artists to the United States, to Los Angeles, we were gonna get them all for CalArts if we possibly could. Uh, they were covering the big expense. We just had to get them out to campus. And so for quite selfish reasons, I, I got involved. And uh, we have a number of artists we actually hired. Um, so we met at the, at the Villa Aurora. So I was known by the leadership, uh, both in the foreign office and um, in the Villa Aurora uh, board. Um, and they were looking for an American to help get this open. Uh, and they came to me um, and the other ingredient was at that moment we were living through the awfulness of President Trump and feeling desperately like one wanted to do something. Not, I mean, you donate money to the other candidates, you, you went to you know, protests, but was there something more you could do? And, and Thomas Monhouse seemed like uh, one route by which you could do something more. Um, I'll just add one other component to that, which is I always imagined my retirement would be a redoing of my education now that I was old enough to appreciate what I read. But I thought I'd go back over my literary education. Instead, I realized I should have been studying, or not should have been, but I would have benefited from studying political economy all along. Um, and actually, if I were at CalArts now, I would one of the things I would try to get, but the faculty would oppose, was that every student be exposed at least to the political economy insofar as it affects the existence of the arts. Uh, so they'd understand more about the context in, in, which, in which they work. Um, so going, going forward, um, and I guess the other component is, I've always thought if America was gonna get to anything like uh, a better version of uh, social democracy, which we don't have in the United States, that, we, that Germany is where we were gonna to have to learn it, even though Germany's losing some of it. Uh, it still was a preeminent example of a, a country trying to take care of its citizens. And if it, if it didn't thrive, there wasn't a chance that the United States was gonna find its way uh, to, uh, to caring about its own citizens in a, in a more substantive way. Uh, so that all came together in a way that has been uh, enormously, uh, it's actually been thrilling. Um, and actually the reason I have these ZKM volumes on my, on my shelf is uh, to, to me, the, the, next, the next challenge for Thomas Monhouse is how do we incorporate artists along with historians uh, and uh, other sort of, uh, I don't know how to put this, but other analysts of sorts, journal, whatever, into the thinking of the Thomas Mann House. And I think these large conferences and, and publications that uh, no one has, I think, has done it at anything like the scale of ZKM. Um, I'm just learning a huge amount uh, that I think I can, we, can, uh, we can apply directly uh, to how we act at the, at the Thomas Mann House. And if I were at CalArts, I wish I'd read the book sooner. Uh, if I, at Kellogg's, we'd have done things. I would have tried to do things a little differently if I had already had that exposure. Maybe I can add something to the second part of your question, Anette. Um, um, if this time of pandemic is very, very worrisome uh, for the students, uh, my advice to them would be um, get prepared. Um, think ahead and uh, don't waste time. Don't miss the times in which you could sort of look out for entertainment or for distraction, but um, take the time of the pandemic, I mean, the present of the pandemic as a challenge and as a chance to educate yourself, to gather as much knowledge as you can. And um, because there will be some some point uh, when it's over, 
at the moment, I think we are sort of at point zero. I remember that for the last 10 or 15 years, uh, in many conversations I had with other artists, we sort of agreed that um, there were no true uh, inventions in, in the arts anymore. Innovation, um, and, and yes, but um, there was nothing truly original. And I think that once we are over this point zero at which we are now, uh, we're going to have the chance because the pandemic is in some ways changing our civilization. It leaves wounds and traces. And once is, this is going to be over, although it's never going to be fully over, we got to learn to live with risks more than we're actually ready because life is about taking risks. But once this eases, there will be a chance for, for new paths to discover, to explore, and to take. And you, your students, will be the ones who, um, who will be um, de in demand then to actually enable um, artists to go those paths. So be optimistic. And don't think too dark of the future, but uh, always think that you can make the best of it and never give up because it's going to be your will and your determination uh, that is going to carry you through this. So think positive and never be afraid of failure because it's going to, it's going to move, you keep you moving. I used to always tell the students at graduation that the last generation is always inadequate to the present moment. And so they are always going to be absolutely necessary um, uh, if we're going to get through the present moment. Um, and of course, they have to absorb the lesson that they also will become the past at some point. Uh, but they don't need to think about that while they're young. Uh, if that, that, comes, that comes soon enough. The other thing, when we lost our campus at the, in the Northridge earthquake, I, I told the students that if, uh, if they stayed enrolled, our, our great worry was that if all the students dropped out as well, which was a reasonable probability, same as it is this year for many colleges, that you had no, why, why pay tuition if I have no campus to go to, um, that, if, that if they stuck it out, this would be the most important semester of their lives. Yeah. Uh, that the lesson of this semester is that you can, and it's really the lesson that Jorn was just talking, that if you, if you stay focused, uh, you can do your work uh, no matter what. I remember a filmmaker saying, if I can't raise the money to make my films in 35, I can make them in 16. If I can't make them in 16, I can make them in eight millimeter. If I can't make it, this was before <laughs> video was the, was, was the, was the norm. Um, if, I, if, I, if I can't do it in uh, super eight, I can do it as storyboards that you can always make your work. Um, and one of the lessons of these awful circumstances uh, can be that uh, the, the disadvantage is um, there is a kind of contagion about being around other people who are being creative. And to, to do it in greater isolation is much harder uh, than knowing that everybody is going to their studios every day and working and everybody is is trying to crack these problems. And um, I think the, the way many faculty have been good at bringing their, their students together with Zoom and trying to keep that spirit alive um, or whatever the, whatever the technology is, um, is, is really essential. Uh, uh, for that contagion. Probably contagion is a bad word when we're living in this virus, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a really great, you know, messages for the students and also coming back to the title of your book, uh, Failure is, is what it is all about. And um, I think it's time for us now to open um, the conversation to our viewers or audience. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. thank you 
very much, Annette, um, for, and thank you all for those um, encouraging and very inspiring words. Um, so we have a couple of questions from the audience that I would like to pass on now. Um, the first question um, is for Stephen, and uh, it refers to this uh, student and institutional and political structures so that were addressed before. So the question says, at CalArts website, the annual tuition for a full-time undergraduate student is up to $50,000. Is this in contrast to artistic freedom? Does it allow failure for all? Uh, it's the greatest single problem that the, the college faces. And it's something um, I and my successor live with every day. Um, and in the American context, um, the, the immediate answer is you have to raise more and more scholarship funds. And you just, if, you're not, if you didn't st spend part of every day uh, asking for money for scholarships, you really weren't doing your job uh, because it had to be possible for the students to be there based on their talents, not that their families could afford it. Um, and one of the things I'm proudest of is is we radically increase the diversity of CalArts uh, economically as well as uh, culturally, ethnically, uh, sort of by, by any parameter. Um, but you're right, it is a contradiction. Um, I toyed with the idea and I tried to bring the faculty to think maybe this doesn't have to be a four-year undergraduate education. Maybe the answer is a three-year undergraduate education. That by itself uh, would save uh, $50,000 plus room and board for that for, for a year. Um, one of my failures was never being able to persuade the faculty to experiment with uh, another format or have part where you're non-resident. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just continuing your education online. But um, the trouble with having a system that, that works for those who can do it is that there's great reluctance to change it. Uh, you, you, you found something that, se that seems to be good and uh, it gets in the, in the way of getting better. Um, but the, the question is exactly right. And uh, there is no question, but there's a generation of artists being partially crushed in the United States by, if, if not driven out of the field, at least forced to spend larger and larger parts of their time Surf, uh, servicing their loans. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hoping Biden is gonna, as president, is gonna help address this. Um, it's looking not so likely, but that's yes. <laughs> not a <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, but now um, I will. I would like to shift uh, the theme, you know, from this political and institutional structures more to the book. And uh, there was another person who, who had a question and also to you, Stephen, again. And the question was, during all those conversations with Jörn, did you learn something new about yourself? And if yes, what did you learn? <laughs> <laughs> um, I learned some things I don't want to say on online. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, it was constantly a... Yorn enabled me, or I mean, maybe I'm living Yorn's fiction rather than my own, but, but uh, Yorn enabled me to put my life together in a way that made sense uh, that I had inklings of, uh, and I could pick certain landmark moments out of, but I, I didn't see uh, the depth of it, and I didn't live with it as, as regular knowledge. Uh, there were also just moments... Um, that sent, sent goosebumps down my arm and I'm just rem remember being forced to remember things by uh, Jorn calls it conversation but he can be an unrelenting conversationalist <laughs> uh, <laughs> demanding that that you really answer that you you really participate not uh, drift away into a, a defensive thought um, mm -hmm. and and I I moments that I just, to me, were, are huge gifts. I still, I carry them with me now, uh, often to do with my family and my, and my background. Um, you get to be my age and it's easy to forget some of your past, 
Um, and uh, Jorn's insistence that the present is shaped by, not insistence, that's not fair, but his searching for the way the present is shaped by your past um, is um, just gave me huge amounts. It's uh, the whole book feels like a great gift from 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 Jorn, uh, something that only a friend would do. And frankly, only with a friend could you be as honest as I was. I admitted things in the book that I never admitted to another person. Um, because you could trust Jorn, not, not to abuse uh, something you told him. Um, and it's, it's been interesting. I, I, I get a lot of emails from faculty who are reading the book and saying, I never knew that. Uh, uh, I never knew you had, I mean, because as president, you act like you always know what you're doing. I, I don't think I fooled anybody, but you try to act like you know what you're doing. Um, and uh, the, the sort of admissions of the extent to which I didn't, um, but was trying along with them just to let's get the next step. Um, in a way, maybe I, I, maybe I could have been better at what I did if I had, if you had written my biography before I, re I lived it instead of afterward. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's very beautiful, beautifully put, um, how you said it. Um, it's very, very nice um, how you describe that. Maybe... Um, Stephen, Stephen, was it a kind of psychoanalytic talking cure? Was it a kind of talking cure? The conversation with Jörn? Jörn, Jörn would come um, have, I mean, doing all sorts of research before he ever came, before we started these conversations. I mean, he discovered when my grandparents passed through Ellis Island, which we, we never knew. Um, and he came with an understanding of what he wanted to accomplish in each session. Um, and although it was a, a kind of free conversation, uh, it was a directed conversation. It was not aimless. Um, and it was also, I mean, a friend said, uh, maybe Jorn has just done your, your psychoanalysis for you. Uh, but, but, but it wasn't psychoanalysis, it was, um, it was bringing, well, maybe that's what psychoanalysis does. It was bringing to consciousness things that you, you were carrying with you um, uh, by the, the forces of sort of stimulating memory. And maybe that's all analysis is in the end anyway. Uh, but uh, I, I think this, his version works better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Um, I would like uh, to put on also a, a last question or to conclude with the last question that came in, which um, um, was referring to the design of the book. <laughs> I'm going to hold it here again. So the question is, uh, what about the cover of the book? Why did you choose it? And does it show a moment of failure or of success? Oh, it's wonderful that this question is being brought up. Um, I'm very glad about it uh, because um, I discovered this photo by chance um, and it relates directly to a story that Stephen tells in the book, which is that he was actually, if I'm not mistaken, he wasn't really able to play uh, basketball or football or whatever because uh, when he was a child, his eyes were um, his eye muscles weren't working properly, so he had ha he had to have several surgeries, um, and he he also goes into uh, into more detail about that in the book, um, narr narr narrating it. Um, but um, it's probably the only moment that uh, Stephen actually did hit the ball for this photo. So whereas he was usually as a child not able to do it because of his sort of confused eyesight then, uh, he was for this photo. So I think it's not a moment of failure, um, but behind that photo is actually much more. A boy he, who wanted to um, take part in the other boys, uh, you know, join, wanted to join in. Uh, with playing with the other, playing with the other boys, and who wasn't really capable of doing that. So it's both. It's it's a moment of success and a moment of failure. But um, you can see that he was very concentrated, 
and also very proud, uh, hitting the ball. And so we can salute him for doing that, for having been able to, to hit the ball in that photo and also um, for CalArts and for himself for his life, so to speak. It's a metaphorical issue, uh, a photo as well. Very beautiful. I, I will never look at this cover uh, again. It's, it's very nice. Well, what's interesting to me is, is I see the ball coming toward me and I look at it and I think I already swung the bat and the ball hadn't arrived yet and I've already missed it. And Jorn <laughs> seems my having hit the ball. So that's a, that, that's a kind of good metaphor as well for <laughs> the way it works. Very good. Very good explanation. Very, very, very beautifully put. So um, I can only conclude um, with an observation from the R RE Future Lab, uh, who wrote a very inspirational and sincere talk. Thank you very much for the personal insights. So I can only join in on that. And on that. That's my side, thank you very much. I would like to repeat, I thank deeply uh, Dr. Leben, also Jörn Rober, and above all, Stephen Levine. And I hope very much that we can repeat this session face to face uh, in real space, in real time, sooner or later. We will see how the uh, pandemic is spreading or not spreading. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for this great opportunity to learn about this really extraordinary, uh, really, very extraordinary book. Thank you so much for sharing with us your knowledge and your wisdom. Thank you. Well, thank all of you for, for getting, for coming together here. Thank you, Annette, for moderating mm -hmm. our talk. And uh, thank you, Adamantia. Thank you, Peter, uh, for having us. Um, it's been a pleasure. And it would be great if we could meet again in person. Absolutely. Thank you also. Thank you, Frau Lehmann. Thank you very much that you did this. Thank you. So, okay. I thank also the audience. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> so.